ओम ज्ञान चिमरंदस्य ज्ञानंजना शलाकाय चक्षुर मिलितांग यही न तस्माय श्री गुरुवे नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गराधा शिवासरी गोर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे वी कंटिन्यूइंग टुनाइट सेवन ओ क्लॉक पी एम न्यूजीलैंड टाइम विद आर वेरीगेटेड डिस्कशन इट सीम्स लाइक ए प्रोमिनेंट थीम that's emerging is bhava and bhava and as you've been hearing just by our changing the pronunciation because of those different vowels in sanskrit you get a entirely different universe so as you know by now bhava means repeated birth and death bhava saga the ocean of repeated birth and death and bhava is the preliminary state of love of krishna the next step is prem i think i'll try to take some questions tonight after i end my presentation but i can point out that a few questions i've received are certainly noteworthy the first one is well how do we avoid being fanatical by going overboard one direction or the other taking too much care of the body and things in relation to the body and not taking care at all how do we find the balance a very popular theme balance but you see in order to balance you have to have something on one side of the scale and something on the other side of the scale so we do need our spiritual life as the first priority and then that brings the other side of the scale in perspective in perspective In other words, bhakti yoga is all about making the best use of the material body and making the best use of the material world. Because everything belongs to Krishna. Aham sarva shapabavo mata sarvam pavartate. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I'm the origin of everything. material and spiritual everything emanates from me when you know this then bhava buddha bhava samanvita hmm. reading various erudite commentators speaking about the coronavirus and its effect on their life and the life of people that they know i found some interesting things because i'm always looking for the krishna perspective on what people think is reality so one was saying that visualize three things even though it's scary you've got to face reality as the human species we've got to face reality together now you may recall the last time we spoke on monday i explained how doomsday talk produces a certain psychological effect surveys show that people tend to freeze up just like 
a deer or a rabbit when faced with the bright lights of an oncoming car. So social scientists complain that if people hear doomsday talk, they'll be stymied and they won't do anything for improving their future. And sometimes we Bhakti outreachers face audiences that want to hear how spirituality will improve material life. Take away the stress, improve the material relationships, allow you to concentrate on making more money, improve your intimate performance, Even our own devotees are not always ready to hear what pure bhakti is all about. And we'll get to that at the end of our session. In other words, ready or not, here it comes. Because we need to hear this. I need to hear it. So that we know what the goal is. And by hearing of that life's ultimate goal, we become purified, and because we are spirit soul, our spiritual appetite starts to increase. And yes, we want that thirst for Krishna to heighten. So let's go back to the 10th canto, mm. chapter 1, text 15. This is... Shukadeva Goswami replying to Bridget Maharaj because Bridget Maharaj has presented him with a list of questions while saying, well, actually, I want to know everything about Krishna. Vrindavan Leela, Mathura Leela, Dwarka Leela, just lay it on me. So, Bridget Maharaj is sure Shukadeva I never tire of hearing this. And in fact, hearing about Krishna's glories is the cure. Remember, Baba Aushadi, the remedy for material existence, solving the whole package deal. And remember how Pritchett Maharaj refers to material existence as a disease. So the bhakti yogi wants to become decontaminated so that his natural love for Krishna revives. So we're at the point now in the dialogue between Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Pritchett where Shukadev Goswami himself is going to reply. Shri Shukavacha Samyag vyavasita buddhis tavarajarshi sattama vasudeva katayam te yajyata naishtiki rati. Srila Shukadeva Goswami said, Oh, your majesty, best of all saintly kings, because you are greatly attracted to topics of vasudeva. It is certain that your intelligence is firmly fixed in spiritual understanding, which is the only true goal for humanity. Because that attraction is unceasing, it is certainly sublime. Purport. Krishna Kata is compulsory for the Rajarshi, or executive head of government. This is also mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, among Rajasayo Vidu. Unfortunately, however, in this age, the governmental power is gradually being captured by third class and fourth class men who have no spiritual understanding, and society is therefore very quickly becoming degraded. Krishna Kata must be understood by the executive heads of government. 
for otherwise how will people be happy and gain relief from the pangs of materialistic life? One who has fixed his mind in Krishna consciousness should be understood to have very sharp intelligence in regard to the value of life. Maharaj Pradikshit was Rajarshi Sattama, the best of all saintly kings, and Shukadeva Goswami was Muni Sattama, the best of Munis. Both of them were elevated because of their uncommon, excuse me, because of their common interest in Krishna Kata. The exalted position of the speaker and the audience will be explained very nicely in the next verse. Krishna Kata is so enlivening that Maharaj Pradichit forgot everything material, even his personal comfort in relation to food and drink. This is an example of how the Krishna Conscious Movement should spread all over the world to bring both the speaker and the audience to the transcendental platform and back home, back to Godhead. So this brings to mind another question, I believe from Barangi Radha Devi Dasi. All right, here we are, ideally relishing Krishna Kata and during this period of self-isolation, sheltering in place that's going on all over the world. Okay, assuming that we are relishing our bhakti practices, still shouldn't we feel compassion for the suffering of billions of pe people of course, when I read the hospital reports from Italy or New York City, my heart aches. But at the same time, my heart aches much more seeing the spiritual ignorance and determination to remain in that ignorance at any cost. So a bhakti yogi's compassion is split level. There's the major mode and the minor mode. The ideal standard we're striving for is demonstrated by Prahlad Maharaj in the seventh canto. He says, I've got no problems. I'm always absorbed in the Mahamrita, the great nectar that nectarian ocean of hearing and chanting about Krishna. So for me, everything is fine, personally. But, I lament for the others who are struggling under the false burden of material existence. Many of you have heard me explain that it's lamentable enough a situation to struggle under a real burden, but to struggle under a false burden. How pathetic. How sad. Maya Sukaya. So-called happiness. Which seems so inviting because everyone is pursuing that dream. This is what the extremely foolish person does, Vimuda. Lifetime after lifetime, as Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, Muda, Janmini, Janmini, birth after birth. So we have a split level compassion. Hmm. We recognize the pain of material existence the pains and horrors perpetuated on the material body and mind. Then again, we recognize we're not the body and mind. And we see the greater problem 
in fact, we see the real cause of all the other problems, which is forgetfulness of Krishna. So again, bhakti knowledge is for the cool-headed person, the deep thinker, or at least someone who wants to develop such intelligence. This material body is a problem. Material existence is a problem. Let's talk about some so-called intelligent approaches to the crises of material life. We spoke the other day <clears throat> about the advice of prominent academics. One super specialist in happiness and well-being. Advising that amidst all this anxiety due to the coronavirus, we get to control our narrative and framing of this crisis. And we also heard from a specialist in cognitive psychology. And he pointed out the great problems affecting the world are not apocalypses in waiting, but problems to be solved. And when people acknowledge that a problem can be solved, they're more likely to focus on it. So what about this taking control of your narrative and framing the situation? Many of you may recall an example I give about a waterfall in New Zealand, Hooker Falls. Some of you I know have been there. It's a big tourist spot. It's empty now because no tourists and everyone has to shelter in place. But there was a canoeist who decided he was going to paddle his canoe down the river that led to the waterfall and canoe over the waterfall. He thought he was that good. So you can imagine, I like to explain, how he looked for the first kilometer paddling down the river. He's an expert canoeist. If you had been watching, you would agree. This guy knows what he's doing. Look at that technique. And look at that expensive canoe. He's got the best. Then he hits the waterfall. And is thrown out of his boat at the bottom of the waterfall as the water is thundering all around him. And he's disappearing under the water and coming up for few seconds and thrashing about and under the water again and the busloads of Japanese tourists watching they knew he's doomed he's finished no matter how expert he is he can be the most expert canoeist the most expert swimmer but he can't fight the waterfall it's much bigger than him but what if in our ignorance we were watching and we just focused on, look at the swimming attire he wears. He's got the latest. Is it billabong or what? Did you see? He kept his head above the water for 10 more seconds than the preceding time. This is a new world's record. Even though he's going down under again, that time he stayed above the water, spitting out water. That was the longest I've seen. Who would think that? No, you'd be overwhelmed by the reality of the situation. He's doomed. So no matter how you try to control the narrative, no matter how you try to frame the situation in its temporal and limited aspects, like his swimming attire, his style, his, the way he coughs water out, and how long it takes before he's finished, you call that controlling the narrative, framing the situation? No. 
everyone will agree the overall situation is totally deadly. So we need to look at material existence in the same way. If you want to control the narrative and frame the situation, learn how to grab hold of the entire problem of material existence. These are the skills that Bhakti equips you with. But these skills are so monumentally huge and what they're dealing with is so monumentally huge that people can't expand their intelligence to see the forest for the trees. Bhakti requires a cool head. That's not constantly agitated by passionate ignorance. So, We constantly need to hear this because we can easily become overwhelmed by attachment to material life and material solutions. Now, as I often point out, if I break my arm and I go to a doctor and he patches me up, puts my arm in a sling, on the way out I, I don't say, well, doctor, no need to thank you because I'm not the body. <laughs> well, you thank the doctor, but you know he hasn't solved your real problems in life. That is the point. So all this bravado talk about take the coronavirus crisis for a chance to control your narrative and frame the situation in a positive way, that instead of it being awful, it's all about your family going through it together. Okay, imagine at the bottom of the waterfall, the Hookah Falls, instead of one canoeist, there's a family of canoeists. They're going through it together. <sighs> Reminds me of another story. I often tell when I was a little kid. Well, maybe nine years old. That's a little kid. So, <laughs> my father in New York City sometimes would put the kids in the car and drive to the edge of what is now called Kennedy Airport, JFK. During peak time, when so many planes were landing. And he'd park on the side of the road and the planes would cross that road with their landing gear down and basically they were just a few, it seemed like a couple of meters, a few few yards above the level of the tops of the cars. And so people would park their cars, get out with their back to the cars and their face toward the incoming airplanes that are landing and just feel the thunderous noise and, uh, and the jet engines and feel like you're part of great human progress. Somehow there, there'd be a whole line of cars doing this. People would be getting their Sunday afternoon jollies from that. So I did it with my brothers. At that time, just with brother and sister. But after a few minutes of facing the oncoming planes, which were landing like every seemed 30 seconds. It seemed like they were just grazing the top of your head with their wheels, their landing wheels, before they landed on the other side of the street. And after a few minutes, I just said, oh, I can't handle this. I'm going back inside the car. And my father <clears throat> became upset. He said, Look, if there's some danger, we're all going through it as a family together. In other words, why are you trying to have a separate experience? Whatever it is, we're going through it together. I always remember that, even though I was nine years old. <clears throat> I was thinking, 
that I don't know if this is the way life is supposed to be. What to do with our body? What to do with this material world? Let me read you something else <clears throat> from a professor of philosophy at Emory University. It's a top school in Atlanta, Georgia. He's based on the coronavirus situation. He wants his students to be more conscious of how fleeting life is, how temporary it all is. So this is what he says. I want my students to experience one of those aha moments to consider the short duration of their lives. I want them to think differently about our time together. I want to remind them that all of us, sooner or later, will become rotting corpses. Sounds blissful. Huh? Death, I explain, is the great equalizer, he says. No matter how smart, brilliant, wealthy, beautiful, and fit you are, no matter how great your academic grades are, no matter what your religious or political orientation is, we'll all perish. So he reports that after he says like this, the whole classroom goes silent and suddenly the students recognize there's been something haunting us in the back of our mind, haunting our joy, haunting our unquestioned and collective happiness, our sense of permanence. We see that now. So everyone goes quiet. They're meditating on the unspoken reality of death. And he describes that this unspoken reality shakes my body. I mourn for me and for my students and for humanity. But he said, then... And I quote continually, continuing, yet a clarity emerges. My students and I see each other differently, perhaps for the very first time. We are no longer simply students and professor, but fragile creatures and mysterious beings who have been dying from the moment we were born. Okay in a universe with no self-evident ultimate meaning. Mm. So, by chance, we temporary conglomerations of matter have, bo have been born in a universe that has no meaning. And so, thinking about that, he says, makes you value more something as ordinary as the person sitting next to you in class. You see that person in a new way. That we're just temporary blips amidst non-existence in a universe that has no meaning. This is tragedy. Who says that the universe has no meaning? we humbly point out that you may not see the meaning, but if you take knowledge and guidance, you will see the meaning. Everything depends on our vision, and our vision depends on purification, decontamination, education. So I found this very tragic. This is a big time professor philosophy. He's speaking this for an interview in the New York Times, which has millions of subscribers around the world. And this is the best he can offer. We're just...
very brief occurrences in an ocean of non-existence. There's non-existence before birth. There's non-existence after death. And so some learned persons say, why make such a fuss out of a little blip of existence amidst infinite non-existence? Just accept that there's no meaning and don't lament. Of course, Krishna sarcastically points this out in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He tells Arjuna, even if you think that we're all just temporary blips, so to speak, in an ocean of non-existence, still you have no reason to lament about fighting in the battle of Kurukshetra. But of course, Krishna does not accept <laughs> that mistaken vision. What's the best that we can do with our life? Another thinker has pointed out, due to the pressure of the coronavirus affecting humanity, he says, just consider your own blip of existence. Next week, your lungs could fill up with fluid, and that could be the end of you. Will you have lived a fulfilling life or not? So he says, that's point number one. Point number two is, what if someone near and dear to you leaves their body because of the coronavirus? Will you have properly transacted love and appreciation in that relationship? Or will you regret? Oh, I never expressed my gratitude, I never expressed how much this person meant to me. So number one, remember, what if your own lungs fill up with fluid due to the coronavirus? Number two, what if that happens to someone near and dear to you? And number three, what about the meaning of life for you and those near and dear to you? And for everyone, have you found meaning in life? In other words, have you reframed your existence? Have you controlled your narrative so that somehow or other you get some kind of meaning in a meaningless cosmos? Sad. So what about this body? What to do? The Acharyas point out that the human body is perfect. But we are misusing it. And in illusion, we're misperceiving it. So what do you mean? You say the body is perfect. Come on. We've already heard Janma Mrichu Jara Vyadi Dukkha Doshana Darshanam. You've already heard this body is riddled by birth, death, disease, and old age. How can that be perfect? But that is the perfect occurrence for those who've forgotten Krishna and are identifying with the body as the self. It's a, it's a nightmare, and that nightmare is perfectly applied. Of course, it takes knowledge to understand that in a nightmare, the person's not actually suffering. The person just needs someone to wake him or her up. And then the person who is apparently suffering realizes it was all a dream. Still, we feel compassion for the person having a nightmare. We don't just laugh watching the person tossing in bed and crying out. We don't laugh. Ah, ha, ha, it's just an illusion. Ha, 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 just a nightmare. No. What do we do? Out of compassion, we wake the person up. That is real mercy. And when the person wakes up, the person is so grateful. It was only a dream. So this human body is a perfect 
vehicle for misusing our independence and learning the lesson. Here are some Shastric examples of how we misperceive. Number one, sometimes we see the sunshine coming from reflection and we think the sunshine is located there in the reflection. Think about that. Or sometimes we see reflection in darkness and think light is there. Number three, we see the clouds supposedly moving over the moon and we think the moon is moving when actually it's just indeed the wind blowing the clouds but to us it looks like the moon's moving so the acharyas make the point that the body the moon and the clouds are perfect but we are misperceiving them because of illusion. So the body is a perfect device, perfectly formed by our karma, our contaminations by the modes of material nature, our desires. But we don't know what to do with it. And as I explained Friday night, we think we can enjoy in a diseased condition. When will we give up that madness? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna asks you to see the difference between matter and spirit. On the highest level of spiritual advancement, the devotee simply sees everything as spiritual because all the energies come from Krishna. On the higher levels of spiritual advancement, the devotee doesn't make a distinction between matter and spirit. But because we have forgotten the spiritual relationship between Krishna and his energies, we need to go through a therapeutic stage in which we indeed recognize the difference between matter and spirit. But bhakti yoga will bring us to that higher level by the process of using this body in Krishna's service and using this world in Krishna's service. And then everything becomes spiritualized. This is very fascinating bhakti knowledge. Everything depends on your perception. The perception of your own body, the perception of others' bodies. The example is also given by the Acharyas that the sun is always the same, but sometimes we feel the energy coming from the sun as hot or cold according to our subjectivity and relativity. But the hot and cold fluctuations don't exist for the sun. Beauty's in the eyes of the beholder. So everything is Krishna's energy, but according to our receptivity, we see this is happiness, this is distress. <laughs> Just like this is cold, this is hot, but the sun is simply, is simply shining giving off heat and light. So this is how to control your narrative. <laughs> this is how to frame your situation. Nothing compares to bhakti in doing that. We're weary of stopgap solutions, trying to cover a tumor with a band-aid, so then we as I was discussing with Apurva Madhuri and her husband Karti. Shall we argue? I've got a tumor in my arm. 
put the bandage on vertically. No, no, put it on horizontally. <laughs> You've got to get the tumor out and make sure your whole system doesn't have cancer cells in it. During this global response to the coronavirus, a response that's happening in many countries, two issues are racking the brains of leaders of society. What do we try to preserve most? The health or the economy? In New Zealand, it seems, they said, we're going for the health. Later, we'll worry about the economy. Other countries are saying, well, let's not be so fast here because not only can people die from health problems, but they can also die from a totally depressed, crashed economy. So what's the proper blend? How do we protect the health and protect the economy if we shut everything down <laughs> like those New Zealanders have done? When will the economy ever come back to life? Okay, we had a technical problem. Somehow there's something happened and the connection was interrupted. So we were speaking about the Panchatattva and how their dancing, their chanting makes things happen. They do another amazing thing in that by their chanting and dancing, they cause the seed of material enjoyment to become impotent. Shil Prabhupada explained something very interesting in the purport. <clears throat> In this connection, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur writes in his Anubhashya that since the living entities all belong to the marginal potency of the Lord, each and every living being has a natural tendency to become Krishna conscious, although at the same time the seed of material enjoyment is undoubtedly within him. The seed of material enjoyment, watered by the course of material nature, fructifies to become a tree of material entanglement that endows the living entity with all kinds of material enjoyment. To enjoy such material facilities is to be afflicted with the three material miseries. However, when by nature's law there is a flood, the seeds within the earth become inactive. Similarly, as the inundation of love of Godhead spreads all over the world, the seeds of material enjoyment become impotent. Thus, the more the Krishna conscious movement spreads, the more the desire for material enjoyment decreases. The seed of material enjoyment automatically becomes impotent with the increase of the Krishna conscious movement. So again, every living entity has within the seed for bhakti as well as the seed for material enjoyment. Every condition soul. But by the activities of hearing and chanting about Krishna, the seed of material enjoyment becomes impotent. This is great mysticism. So if there anyone, is anyone who has questions, although we lost our connection, I don't see questions there, so.
I'll wait a few moments. And if nothing appears, we'll call it a, we'll call it a night due to technological interruption. All right. We look forward to speaking to you on Friday night, which according to the New Zealand Vaishnav calendar is Sri Ramchandra's appearance day. So we'll speak a little about Ram Leela. Thank you. Hare Krishna.